Good morning. We're thrilled to welcome you to Writing All Over the Map, a conversation with Gary Christ and Robert Wright. I'm Bruce Peterson, your host for today's session. Gary Christ is the best-selling author of four works of narrative nonfiction, The Mirage Factory, Empire of Sin, City of Scoundrels, and The White Cascade, as well as five works of fiction. He's also written for the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, National Geographic Traveler, Esquire GQ, and the Hudson Review, where he's been an advisory editor for over 20 years. Gary received the Sue Kaufman Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Stephen Crane Award, a Lowell Thomas Gold Medal, and a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship. He is currently a National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar for 2020-21. Robert Wright, is the author of The Evolution of God, a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Uh, uh, the Moral Animal, named one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times Book Review. Three Scientists and Their Gods, a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist. Non-Zero, and most recently, Why Buddhism is True, The Science and Philosophy of Meditation and Enlightenment, a New York Times bestseller. He's written for The New Yorker, The Atlantic, New York Times, Time, and The New Republic. Bob has taught in the psychology department at Penn and the religion department at Princeton. He hosts The Right Show, a podcast also posted in video form on Meaning of Life TV and Blogging Heads TV. He also publishes the Non-Zero newsletter available on Substack and at nonzero.org. Gary and Bob have known each other since campus club days and have read each other's work in progress throughout their careers. We know you will enjoy meeting them today. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions. You may also use the chat function to say hi to your friends. Gary, Bob. All right, there we are. Oh, Thank you, Bruce. Yeah. Bob, oh, yeah, there's, there's Bob. There I am. How are you, Gary? All right, how are you? Can't complain. Well, um, we together decided that more or less, rather than talk about any particular project that one or the other of us has worked on, that we'll just have a casual conversation about our paths as writers and friends. And um, over the decades, it's it's been decades. Has it? And, Has and it been decades, not, Gary? Believe it or not. Huh. I mean, we don't look it, but. No. Um, <clears throat> And then as, as individual, we come to individual books, we can talk in, in greater length. Um, but the, the title of the talk, Writing All Over the Map, is meant to convey that uh, we have both done a wide variety of different kinds of writing about different subjects. Um, my thesis, I don't know if you would agree, is that uh, you have had this through line, though, tying together everything that you've done, which is namely like the insights of Darwin, evolutionary psychology, natural selection, and how that has shaped everything from human behavior to religion to international affairs. Whereas I, on the other hand, have been a lot more- All over, all over the map. All over the map, as the title says. Uh, I started out writing literary short stories. I wrote a couple of thrillers. I wrote a historical comic novel. And then it was only really until I guess about 15, 20 years ago, where I kind of got my groove. Uh, I became obsessed with this uh, idea of American cities and how they grew. Um, so my last four books have been narrative nonfiction about American cities. But um, why don't we go to the beginning, uh, Princeton, where we met. And as I recall, you were an army brat who traveled all over, grew up all over the country, but ended up in Texas. And you came to Princeton from Texas Christian University in sophomore year, right? That's, that's true. I was a transfer student. Um, wound up uh, majoring at the Wilson School, partly because you had needed an excuse to transfer. You needed to cite a special reason that you should be at Princeton. And so like I looked, I found out about the Wilson School and I claimed that that was the reason. <laughs> and then I just stuck with it, I guess. Uh -huh. uh, and um, but that was a, a great experience. I always thought um, that you and I kind of had a little bit in common. I don't think either of us came from super highbrow kind of backgrounds. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, very different backgrounds in a certain sense. You were you were born and raised in New Jersey. Well, you were raised yeah. in New Jersey. Yeah, I, I 
was born and raised a couple of exits north of Princeton on the Turnpike. Uh -huh. um, so, I mean, Princeton was kind of seemed like an alien culture to me. And I'm wondering if it seemed like oh, that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I definitely did not feel that it was my place at first. Um, but, uh, you know, let's not talk about that. <laughs> I, I want to talk about uh, what must have been a formative experience for you, which is taking John McPhee's course. Now, uh, did, did you come to, did you know that you were going to be a writer and therefore take McPhee's course or did taking McPhee's course sort of say, oh, I want to be a writer? I had, my mother had first put the idea of journalism in my head uh, and I read all the president's men, uh, you know, and got excited. The, the, the Watergate hearings were happening when I was in high school. Woodward and Bernstein were all the rage. Um, so it was kind of in my mind. And in fact, I had been a journalism major at TCU. But I think uh, McPhee's course gave me the confidence to actually try. Um, mm -hmm. His feedback gave me the confidence to actually try to to be a writer. I, I think I was I was kind of thinking about law school pretty seriously, too, uh, as a lot of people at the Wilson School were. Um, but yeah, we didn't I mean, we didn't know each other that well in college. We were both in campus club. Right. We knew each other a little through uh, the inimitable Gordy Kodak, our classmate. Yes. And um, but we didn't hang out that much. So I don't actually know that much about your aspirations at the time. Like, were you planning to be a writer? And if so, fiction, I would I assume fiction was I, I, I did. I did come to Princeton thinking that I was going to be a writer. Um, and to my lasting regret, I never took McPhee's course because I was all about fiction and, and mm -hmm. then. And I actually never took a creative writing course at all at Princeton. I uh, applied for a poetry writing class in freshman year, but in what would become sort of a pattern, I was roundly rejected. And so I said, all right, well, to hell with the uh, creative writing department. Um, and there were certainly many other courses that I wanted to take. In fact, I think my favorite, one of my favorite courses at Princeton and the one that probably contributed to our becoming friends was uh, Physics for Poets, which uh, was taught by a guy named uh, Don, uh, Don Coyne, I think. And um, it was not the gut course that it sounds. Uh, there was no higher mathematics in it, but um, it was pretty rigorous. And that's where I read about quantum mechanics and, and relativity which is what ultimately did, I think, bring us together as friends. In a way, you mean uh, after college when? Right. Yeah. Right. All so, right. So we weren't that we weren't that friendly in college. Um, and we then, weren't we weren't hostile. Let's be clear. No, we just we just didn't <laughs> hang out. Well, there was no intent. Saying about you behind your back. And, and and I also knew Elizabeth knew her as Betty, who right. became your wife. Right. She was well, called Betty then. And yeah. she was in campus club, but knew her in the same way, kind of distantly. Uh, um, and uh, then, you know, we graduated and uh, you you stayed in Princeton for a year, right? You were uh, trying to be a freelance writer, which which didn't work out super well. Uh, and then I went and lived a year in Philadelphia with other Princeton alums, uh, your friend Betsy Lukens, um, Jeff, Char uh, Jeff Sharpless, Peggy Russell, Kathy Kovner, right, uh, and, and and Keith Corbett, and and you, and that's where we kind of right. you were visiting Betsy there, right. So that was another year of me trying without great success to be a freelance writer, and you um, you visited, I guess, stayed overnight, and um, and we talked a lot about kind of physics and philosophy. I guess you knew more about that than I did at the time. I think. Oh, you know, I still. I do, I don't believe that. No, I wasn't that well versed. I've learned. I I've I've learned it, some of it on the job, kind of writing a little about it and and interviewing people and stuff. But I think you had clearly thought. I, I definitely learned. I I remember getting the sense that you knew a lot of stuff I didn't. Um, I think we probably talked about Heisenberg and, um, and. You had also uh, you had written you had published this travel piece in the New York Times by then I think right right yeah I I had gone after graduation I did a Fulbright year in Germany 
which was I was supposed to be studying German literary theory, and I ended up using it as a, a writing fellowship. And um, in the two months between semesters, uh, I traveled. And the first month, I traveled with Roz Cohen, who I think may be out there listening today. Yep, she, I saw Roz at a reunion not that long ago. Yeah, she, she was in uh, she was in Campus Club. And she, uh, I think she was also doing a Fulbright in, in Lisbon though. And we traveled around Spain and, and Portugal for a month. Then I uh, sheared off and went to Morocco and joined this mountaineering trip where we climbed the highest mountain in Morocco. And so I came back, I wrote an article about that and I submitted it to the Princeton Alumni Weekly, which roundly rejected it. Uh, so that's, said, that's pretty harsh, that's pretty harsh. You climbed the highest mountain in North Africa or something, and you can't get it published in Alumni Weekly. But so I, I went to my second choice, which was the New York Times, and they there's a happy ending. Uh, uh, so, um, and I guess, yeah, I guess that had just come out when we were uh, at that house together. Yeah. So I was impressed. New York Times. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a long. So at that point, what were you thinking in terms of fiction versus nonfiction? Um, I, was I was totally about fiction. The mm -hmm. stories that I had written in Europe were these bizarre, magical, realist things. I had read too much hmm. Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Wow, that that, that was, never surfaced. I never saw. No, I never I, saw that part. I, mean, of I published a couple of them in, in small literary magazines, hmm. but at a certain point, I had that realization. It's totally banal, but you know, I just thought, well, write what you know. So I started writing these stories about the Garden State up in New Jersey, the Garden State, and that that became the Garden State. Um, and as that was going on, we we were living in New York, and, and, then, and now we were both in Brooklyn, very close. Right. Within, I mean, you know, maybe a quarter mile uh, from each other, as it happened. Right. You were um, working at the sciences then. You were writing the Information Age. Uh, I was writing, I, I was working at the Sciences Magazine, like many publications I've worked for, it no longer exists. It was at the uh, New York Academy of Sciences. I was doing a lot of editing, but I also had, I'd gone there to edit, but had started writing a column called The Information Age, yeah. Um, Which won a National Magazine Award, as I recall. It did, it did. That was my one, I think that's the one award I've actually won. <laughs> um, unless, if another one springs to mind, I'll let you know. And, mm -hmm. and you, uh, for the Garden State, I mean, first, I want to show this. I know people may have seen it in the opening thing, but this was published in this brand. The Vintage Contemporaries was like the coolest place to be seen as a fiction writer. It really was because so they were they all had this design. And Jay McInerney, who had written kind of the hottest, certainly the hottest New York novel, maybe the hottest novel among kind of young people for a time that had been a vintage contemporary. And like, here's the Garden State. And um I, you want, I was the uncoolest person on their list, though. Well, I wasn't going to point that out, but um, but thank you for for, uh, for for fessing up to that. I, I don't know about that, but you did win this major thing, right? The the Sue Kaufman Award for First Fiction is like that's like the award in America for First Fiction, right? Well, it, it well, is all sharks, it is. <laughs> Um, but uh, were, were we reading each other's work in ma in manuscript? Yeah, I read this. In, I read the, I read this in draft and commented on it. And I don't know that you were reading. I don't think you're reading my columns in draft. But my first book, which I was writing about the same time, Three Scientists and Their Gods, you read in draft. Right. And I I, rem I vividly remember reading it, and at a certain point, just getting up and going to the telephone and calling you because people did that in the 1980s. I remember that. And, and I saying essentially, dude, you're blowing my mind here because there was so much in that book that I just was, you know, it was reawakening all those physics for poets kind of uh, signals in my brain. And um, yeah, I actually wrote a poem or something. You said this. You don't, you don't remember this? I don't remember this. Well, but... just quickly, the first, I'll try to make this fast. First part of the book, profile of a guy who has a theory of digital physics where the universe is this program, people now are kind of catching up to that. But anyway, there was this kind of computer program called the cellular automaton, where each stage in the evolution of the digital pattern is determined by the previous stage in accordance with the rule. So you wrote a poem that followed that, like you had a rule and the first line would be converted automatically 
into the second. And I remember part of the poem was the world's first cellular automaton poem. And and and, uh, and you sent it to me and I should have sent it to Ed Fredkin. And I, I think I never did. He was the he was the he was the guy with the crazy theory of uh, physics. But um, well, I'm sure that's been lost to, to history now. You know, there's a lot of stuff in my attic, possibly <laughs> including a picture of us on horseback in Canada. Uh, I'll let you know what turns up if I don't die before <laughs> before I go up into my that's attic. Right. Again. That, that, that we, we did a horse packing trip uh, to the Banff. That was in the 80s. That was uh, seven, I think, and um, that we thought, you know, we'd we'd talk about Einstein in the mountains, but I think we ended up talking about the digestion problems of our respective horses. Gary, let's keep this classy, man. <laughs> let's let's. Uh, uh, there may have been the occasional flatulence joke, <laughs> and 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 those horses certainly were active in that regard. But uh, hey, we went to an Ivy League school, okay? Right. Um, and so, so our, basically our first books came out the same year, 1988, and then they came out in paperback in 1989. And Bruce, I think you have an, a visual, the first of two visual artifacts that we're gonna show here. If you can throw that up on the screen. Um, I, the hardbacks did not come out at the same time, but um, there were- That, uh, people- it's been so long that we probably have to explain that that picture is of me. It was taken by my wife, Lisa. <laughs> I, um, I was going to say you look exactly the same. Haven't but, changed uh, a bit. The um, yeah. So those are our two books. Now, that's the year your book was published, right? No, because no, the no, thing, mine, of, mine yeah. was published in '88 when yours was published. Okay, okay. Was, so, so it did have a hardcover before the vintage contemporary. So this okay. is vintage contemporary. Yeah. Okay. Because sometimes vintage contemporaries were published first in right. paperback. Right. That's but not in your case. Okay. Started with that model, but then they gravitated toward a more traditional model. So yeah, we were we were we were new and noteworthy and we were side by side, which is uh, kind of amazing. Of course, you got the picture, but I won't complain. Well, I I, I I'm not gonna complain. <laughs> and then you moved to Washington from Brooklyn. Yeah, and and got married. Got married to the, the aforementioned Lisa who took that picture. And you at that point were not yet in. I mean, our, our lives are eerily parallel. So you later moved down there? Yeah, yeah. We, we stayed in Brooklyn for a, a long time after that until the early 90s. Well, that's not that long, is it? <laughs> no, because um, we didn't, Lisa d didn't move down there till. 89 probably but well no 88 we, we got married in 88 so well there is um, a, there is that other uh visual artifact that uh the mailgram that i sent you and lisa <laughs> yeah yeah, <I> remember, yeah, <laughs> yeah we are that old that that uh i was shocked to remember that there were such things right um uh throw it, up that mailgram yeah, it was, we had just gotten married and you sent your congratulations. And this is before I had written the book on evolutionary psychology. And yet the theme in the mailgram you sent was Darwinian. So I guess this is right. after I, I had published a piece in the New Republic on this. Well, you knew, I, well, you knew I was kind of a, a Darwin obsessive. Um, oh, and yeah, that's the mailgram. What does it say exactly? Some joke about, some uh, joke about genes. Marriage, good evolutionary move, high hopes for the gene pool. Yeah, that was um, good. <laughs> and as it happens, uh, I did have two daughters who became friends with your daughter. Yeah, they were very Anna. Wow. Yeah. Um, and uh, because you because after you moved down, you lived in uh, I lived in Chevy Chase, D.C. By then you lived in Chevy Chase, Maryland, a Tony or an arguably Tony or place. But um. Uh, and they they trick or treated together and stuff. Yeah, the yeah. The, I we moved down there in '94. That's uh, I I did a, I tried to write a couple of novels, unsuccessfully, and uh, ended up using one of them as part of a second collection, which was Bone by Bone, and mm -hmm. um, that came out right before we moved to Washington. And the reason we moved to Washington is Elizabeth, who was a photo editor got a job at National Geographic. 
I was ready to quit my day job, um, which I'm embarrassed to admit what it is. Um, Could have been worse. I mean, it was at Stanley Kaplan, which is right. just a, at least a legit SAT prep thing, <laughs> unlike the Princeton Review, which taught you how to basically cheat on the SAT. But go ahead. Well, yeah. Um, and so, I, you know, I tried commuting from D.C. back to New York for a year, but I wasn't getting any writing done. So I decided that I would write a thriller so that I could quit my job, which I did. Um, I wrote something called, and your fingerprints are all over the titles at least. Uh, the first one was called Bad Chemistry. And the second one was called Chaos Theory. Um, Wait, did I, I didn't come up with those titles, did I? No, no, you didn't, but they're, you know, they're science. I'm I'm trying, I see what you mean. I'm trying um, to develop a theme here, Bob. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, this is, I'll get out of your way. This is, yeah, it's your theme. The um. Yeah, and I read those in draft, and I had read Bone by Bone in draft. And so you, what, what about the decision to move to, to, to thrillers? It, this was, I mean, they weren't, I think your publisher considered them literary thrillers, right? Wasn't that the uh, yeah, idea? I, I mean, they, I knew that they were going to sell a hell of a lot more than the two collections of short stories, and that, that was my problem. I mean, um, Bone by Bone, the second one, didn't even go to paperback. Uh, mm -hmm. And Marty Asher, the publisher of Vintage Contemporaries, took me aside and said, you know, your second collection is better than your first, but we're not going to publish it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, basically because it's not going to sell. Well, and, short stories are a tough, are a tough sell. Yeah, yeah. So, but at this time you were working at the New Republic. Right? That's why I'd gone to Washington, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you were working on The Moral Lounge. Right. But I mean, it came out in 94, the book on uh, evolutionary psychology. Yeah. Um, but obviously, I mean, that telegram of yours is from six years earlier. So my 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 interest in in uh, natural selection was already evident back then, I guess. Um, yes, yeah, so you came. You, yes, yeah, so you came down as that was coming out. Um, you read you read that in draft for sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I always thought your comments were too too generous in the sense that they were pretty spare. I mean, you didn't, you didn't uh, pepper them, pepper the text with criticisms. Um, um, I thought I, you were too, too lenient a judge maybe, but. Really? Well, I, I don't know. The, the world has ratified my uh, <laughs> uh, lack of issues with, with your books, I guess. Um, I mean, you were pretty controversial there for uh, around that. Wasn't that when you wrote something for Time Magazine called Infidelity? Is it <laughs> that wasn't my title. That's what they put on the cover. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, the, the, the book included stuff about how, you know, given evolved male and female sexual psychology, among other things, marriage is not, you know, a, a, a monog life, lifelong monogamous marriage is not really a natural thing and not an easy thing and so on. And I thought it was like a pretty nuanced picture. And then Time puts on the cover, it was a picture of a broken wedding band and it said infidelity, it may be in our genes. So that became my persona as I, because that was the big publicity angle for the book. I mean, I was lucky, I was very lucky. It was, it was an excerpt from the book adapted. Uh, by me, but um, you know, it became a publicity angle. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of some of the like local like radio hosts and, and, and stuff like thought I was there to defend infidelity. <laughs> they were suffering from uh, what you might call the naturalistic fallacy. Right. Um, and uh and didn't, so you, I, didn't your mother's uh my pastor? my mother's uh the pastor at my mother's church did denounce that <laughs> cover story from the pulpit, not realizing that her son had written it. Um, but you know, you know, mothers, her pride was unshakable. Uh, um, so yeah, uh, and I mean, you're, 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 you're more book wise, more prolific than I am and much more regular in your output. Um, I mean, you like, I, I guess this is in a way, I don't know if this is more evident with your nonfiction ones, but it's like, you like say like, OK, I'm going to finish this, you know, in like 19 months or something. And it actually happens. Right. I mean, yeah, that's because I'm not I, I don't have a media empire the way you. Do. <laughs> yeah, right. That's my problem uh, going. Um, but um, 
All right, so we're in the 90s now, right? Yeah, uh, so, so um, okay, so that's your thriller phase. <laughs> you're, you're, uh, and, you know, the second one was supposed to be a sequel to the first one with the same character. The main character was a, um, an ex, a female ex-cop uh, who was supposed to go on and do something in the second book. And I started writing that book and I just said, I can't write a sequel. So I, I wrote a, a different book and um, it didn't do nearly as well. Um, and my English publisher basically said, we wanted another Kate Baker book, so we're not publishing this book. Um, hmm. But at this point I said, I, you know, I'm tired of writing for money. I want to write a book for myself. And I had reviewed a book about financial manias for, right. think, for Salon. And this was in the 90s when, you know, the tech boom was going on and the stock market was going through the roof. And I got this idea to write this novel that took place both in 1990s New York and in 1690s London. Um, it was basically about financial manias. It had the same characters in both time periods, but it hopped between the two. Right. Which turned out to be... Confusing. As is kind of exemplified by the cover, which I'm holding up. Right, right. And uh, it, it, uh, it was, some people were confused. I remember reading a customer review on Amazon or something that said, there seemed to be some kind of time machine, but he never mentioned it. Uh, but what, what it was basically was, it, I was making the point that these two, two eras were similar and yeah. the, the same characters can sort of appear in both. And uh, it, yeah. it uh, was not a success. <laughs> I'm just looking at the jacket copy, and maybe if this reader had read that, uh, that would have removed any disorientation. But the I thought that was a great book, and and it was a a book that I think not many fiction writers could have written. I mean, one thing about you is I I think of you as um I I don't think of you as having I, I mean maybe my conception of what a typical fiction writer's sensibility would be is just a crude stereotype, but I don't I, I think of you as kind of unusual in how analytical you are um, and how, I mean, I think some people, if you ask them about their work, like, why'd you write, do it this way? What, what does this mean? And so on. They wouldn't have a super clear answer. I think you always would. Um, and, uh, but, but anyway, this book involved like a very careful comparison. I mean, you can imagine an economist writing a paper comparing the two and, 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 and these two eras where there were financial bubbles and um and you 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 in effect did that and 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 drew out the the parallels um and uh so i think i disagree with the amazon customer anyway i i, I like the book uh -huh. well i i but I, but can you tell me do you think you're do you do you think you have an unusual sensibility for a fiction writer in, in somewhat the way i mean I mean, you did wind up writing nonfiction. Nonfiction, yeah. Um, I I don't actually, but hmm. um, I I don't think of myself as particularly analytical. But um, oh, come on! I don't know. But all right. So, but at the same time, you were writing a book that non-zero, which mm -hmm. is kind of related to Darwin. I mean, the the yeah. It's game theory. It's like looking at history through game theory, right? And and I mean, genes play games. To, to well, the, a small part of the book is that you can view ev biological evolution as game theory, as an expansion of non-zero sum dynamics involving genes, um, and and that that could be used to explain the growth of biological complexity. Most of the book was an attempt to explain the growth of social complexity. You know. How do you get from hunter gather village, which was the most complicated society 20,000 years ago, to being on the brink of a global community? And I, I described it as a, as, a, as a kind of, you know, in terms of game theory, right? Uh, it was evolutionary in that, in that sense, but it was more about cultural evolution, broadly speaking, to include, you know, politics, religion, uh, you know, all the evolution of all non-genetic information in, in a way. Um, but it was evolutionary, but not so literally, not so literally Darwinian. I mean, I mean, it did assume human nature. Uh, but 
yeah. No. Anyway, I did. You're right. I wrote. <laughs> I wrote the book. And uh, Bill Clinton was a big champion of that. Bill book. Clinton. It was strange. He read it, and he just talked and talked and talked about it. Uh, I mean, I mean a lot. Like, I mean, if he had done, if he had, not that I'm complaining, but if he had done that, like on pub day, <laughs> <laughs> we would have had a much different sales profile. I mean, I, I'm not complaining about that either. But it was kind of like. Seven or eight months after it, it seems like he picked it up six, seven months. And you know how it is with books. I mean, there's this there's this short period when yeah. your publisher's marketing and so on. And it's kind of, you know, and publishers, I mean, like sometimes before a book even comes out, like they've decided, oh, well, this one didn't work. You know, sometimes six months before they've decided. Yeah, no, literally. And of course, it, it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So but anyway, I can't complain. He talked about a lot. He clearly read it. He he characterized it accurately. I actually got to talk to him about it briefly in Princeton when he was there for class day a uh, few years in the in the aughts, um, which was an interesting experience. Uh, he's a very well read person. Uh, he reads a lot of books yeah. <laughs> and remembers them. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, that was a good break. It, it, see, I, I feel like I've gotten a lucky break with every book. I haven't written that many books. I've written five books, but I, but I feel like I've gotten at least one lucky break with every one. Mm -hmm. That was that one. So that non-zero was 2000, right? Yep. And then, then you went to the evolution of God, which is kind of applying similar principles to the evolution of religion, right? It was kind of, yeah, it was kind of the, the, the non-zero books thesis applied to the evolution of religion among other things yeah but yeah. now this at this point you you've moved away from dc right yeah i was uh i had moved back to princeton um for odd reasons i mean my, my i no longer had a reason to be in dc lisa's family is kind of spread around the new york area what so it made sense to be closer to them um and uh, so, yeah, I was actually there and uh, I actually taught a little at Penn. I mean, I don't I don't have a Ph.D., but uh, because a dean there had read, I guess, The Moral Animal, I got to teach a little in a way that helped me, pre uh, you know, prepare the Evolution of God book. I was learning through teaching. And um, uh, so, yeah, that's a very long book. Uh, and that I mean, that came out in. 2009? 2009 so there was nine years between uh non-zero and and the evolution god that's what i mean you crank them out yeah more than I, do. I i think you started blogging heads tv in there didn't you, you I, and mickey Kaus? yeah i did yeah um, we i i started it with uh mickey Kaus and a, and a tech guy named greg dingle and it was it was you know it was a thing i mean it still is a thing but it was a uh, but there's so many things like it now. Uh, I know. I mean, when I when I look at Zoom now, and everybody's doing Zoom, and I just think, well, Bob was doing that 15 years ago. Um, it really was. Yeah, although it was so early that the people were not communicating online. You you know, the the key to the thing was not that this matters, but uh, was the technique, which was people would actually be having a phone conversation, locally recording their video. And then we would splice them together on a server. So this was the reason it, it you know, gained any prominence at all. Well, it was for a while it was featured on the New York Times. But the reason it was unusual enough to get their attention was because uh, it was basically pre pre broadband. Uh -huh. But yeah. yeah. Um, so that was yeah. Uh, I still do that. I still I mean, you know, but it's like lost in the ocean now. You and Mickey are still doing it, right? Well, we've revived it. I mean, most of the things I've done have been with other people. I do two a week, one's with him. We revived this uh, with the pandemic. It became a pandemic podcast. And so we do it uh, on Fridays. Uh, um, he, I mean, yeah, well, and whole we did, story. We did a couple of episodes together, right? Right, with, you, um, with your uh, talking about um, books of yours. Sounds, yeah, well, I guess to bring this up to uh yeah we we enter the non-fiction phase of your right life after now. you know i was i you know extravagance did not do that well i was frustrated 
I had loved going to London to do the research. So I remember sitting at lunch with my agent complaining about the sales of uh, extravagance. And he said, well, if you love doing the research so much, why don't you write nonfiction narrative? I mean, I can uh. sell that a lot easier. And, and um, so I was looking around for a subject. I was very much into English history then. So I was Googling the Duke of Wellington and I came upon this web page about something called the Wellington Avalanche, which was the <laughs> avalanche in American history. I didn't know it happened like that. That's and funny. I read, I read the description. Basically, these two trains were coming over the Cascade Mountains in 1910, going toward uh, Seattle. And they were stranded in this huge snowstorm for days and days and days. And finally, a big avalanche came, took both of them off the side of the mountain and ended up killing about 100 people. And it's the deadliest avalanche in American history and no one's ever heard of it. So I said, maybe I should write about this. And so that's sort of how I made the transition. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a lot about railroad history and how the railroads made Seattle into a city. And that kind of got me interested in, in the, how cities develop. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so all the books since then have been about individual cities and, and how they came to be. And I think you and I did a Flying Heads TV about City of Scoundrels, which was my book about Chicago, and yep. Empire of Sin, which was the book about uh, New Orleans. Right. Yeah, I mean, let me just say the White Cascade is is really good. I mean, I mean, it's like the, the version of it everyone's heard of is the Donner Pass. But this one, I don't know how well documented the Donner Pass is, but but the White Cascade, that, that the Wellington thing turned out to have a lot of documentation, right? Oh, yeah. And things like, you know, there was a, an old woman who was keeping a diary. Up there. Yeah, that kind of thing. I mean, it was like it was like minute by minute in some cases. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, Bruce, I think we have a picture of the a historical picture of the avalanche that maybe you could throw up. Um, there was there were also court cases. I, I, I spend a lot of time these days reading court transcripts uh, because, yeah, that is the result of the avalanche. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, yeah, there we go. Is that a house or a? No, that's a train. That's, that's a, a train. train. Oh yeah, okay, it is a train, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a bad, that's a bad break for the train. Yes. Um, and so, uh, yeah, then I, I got interested in how cities develop. And, um, you know, I just think of cities as, kind of this incubator of most new ideas. And the reason is because it, they bring together people of all backgrounds, races, and you know, economic circumstances and ethnicities. And um, you know, it creates a lot of ferment, it creates a lot of conflict. And mm -hmm. what I write about is conflict. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that that's what makes cities so interesting. And so is, is there a name for the genre? <laughs> like uh, Gary's books, I believe. Gary's books, Gary's uh, Gar phase three of Gary's books. Um, I, I don't I, urban narrative history. Urban narrative history. Well, that's you should you should like teach a course on that. Um. Yeah, that's good. Did you just come up with that urban narrative history? Or narrative urban history? I don't know which is better. Uh. Uh. I, it depends on. I don't know. We'll, we'll think this through. I mean, we, we can we can take this all offline and think about the okay. the acronymic implications and everything. Um, but uh, yeah, and those those are great books. Uh, the the um, the 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 most recent one we did was the New Orleans book. Right. Uh, we should do the Los Angeles book. Oh, it's already that, old. It's already old. That doesn't matter. Um, the. Uh, because I mean, I was so fascinated by the way, um, you know, it's funny, uh, D.W. Griffith, uh, you know, the guy who did uh, Birth of a Nation, which of course has entered, uh, been referenced in recent developments at Princeton because Woodrow Wilson said something, which by the way, was taken out of context. It's actually not favorable in the way it seems. Right. He's using the word great to me. questionable whether he actually said it, but. He's using the word great. Well, there's something he writes where, in his written work, where he uses the word great to mean large, not to mean good. But anyway, I digress. I'm not I'm not here to defend Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> um, but but uh, but um, 
it, it, what what fascin I mean, first of all, as it happens, you know, Lisa and I on our honeymoon, we spent a couple of nights uh, at actually what turns out to have been his estate. There's a place called Blantyre up somewhere in uh, near the Berkshires. Uh, that, that that turns out was owned by him, and you can like stay there. And there's a hmm. there there's like a, a, it's it's fancy and fun. But what what amazed me about that book is, uh, well, uh, what that taught me is that just being ahead of your time a little technologically can give a certain kind of artist a tremendous amount of power. I mean, that's what got, that's what got, that's what he had going for him, right? He just did stuff with cameras that was, that was slightly new. And that allowed him to turn a movie with actual political implications into this huge event, right? Yeah. Well, he took credit for uh, inventing a lot of things that he didn't invent. You know, in in the early years of the 20th century, people were just trying things out. And, and you know, he kind of picked and chose things that other directors were doing. His particular contribution, I think, was putting them all together into a, an almost like visual grammar of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as as repugnant as some of those stories are, they're effective because he just he, he knew how to tell a story. With, with that, that, that That's what I mean. I mean, a different kind of treatment of the same with the same political implications might not have uh, done as well. So anyway, I mean, now we're getting into conversation I would have if we did do uh, a podcast on 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 mm -hmm. on the on the book but um uh so that's the one about la there's three there's kind of basic is it three or four different stories that constitute that book uh, one three. of which is hollywood th three there's hollywood there's water and there's amy uh it's, yeah. Yeah. it's funny because as i was thinking about this talk i i realized that my latest book is kind of like your first book in that it focuses on three characters right um not that that means anything but <laughs> um, i'll take credit I, i'll 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 consider myself your role model uh -huh. um and then the uh, and then the new orleans book is amazing uh because of the i mean it is there is the birth of jazz but the way that's tied up in ethnic politics is is something i was totally unaware of um yeah, i mean uh, it, it, i'm finding Although each of these cities is different, they there are really patterns in, in what goes on, and it's it's always kind of on the one side there are the reformers who are allegedly progressive, but are usually not very progressive, and particularly on issues of race, for instance, like Woodrow Wilson, the progressive, and mm -hmm. then there's the like the machine politicians who are usually tied into the vice element and, and mm. entertainment and things like that. And they're usually, you know, the, the recent immigrant groups who, who have, particularly the Irish, became heads of many, many, many cities. And, you know, it's the, the kind of progressive reform element that got to write history. So they made themselves out looking looking a lot better than the machine politicians. But one thing I'm finding is that the machine politicians had a lot going for them. Like the, the mayor of, of uh, Chicago in, in my Chicago book is extravagantly corrupt, widely regarded as one of the worst mayors in, in uh, any city in history. But he had, he had some real virtues and um, he was beloved of the uh, black population in Chicago because he was really the first city politician who realized that uh, a city's black population was a voting block that could be won. And so he was much more attentive to the black population than were the, you know, the mm, people the yeah. who were complaining about how corrupt he was. So, um, and, and this is something you see in, in all these cities um, in the early 20th century. So that's, yeah. you know, those parallels I'm seeing, but. But each one is kind of different, which is kind of fun for me. And um, of course, you know, I, I sincerely love all of these cities, but New Orleans is, is always going to, I think, be be the one that's my favorite. But that was a very naturally good story. 
Um, uh, but yeah, let's it, talk about Buddhism because we're. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So my book, modestly titled "Why Buddhism Is True." <laughs> um, I mean, how did how did you start getting into Buddhism? Well, you know, I had probably, I mean, ever since college, you know, in college, you hear about Eastern ideas and they're supposed to be cool and you should at some point try to meditate. I had tried it. It never worked. For whatever reason, I took the advice of someone and tried an actual meditation retreat because I'd never been the kind who could, whenever I tried to meditate, it hadn't seemed to work. Um So I did a week-long, truly silent meditation retreat at a place called the Insight Meditation Society in 2003. And, you know, it was a a retreat can be an extremely powerful experience. It's a real, you know, your, your, your consciousness can just be transformed. I mean, remember, you're not getting any news from the outside world. You're not, I mean, if you're doing it right, you're not talking to anyone uh, in your family, friends, you're not talking to anyone at the retreat it's completely silent you're meditating i guess we did at that one sitting meditation of maybe four and a half hours a day walking meditation of four and a half hours a day you would you would hear a dharma talk at night anyway uh, it it in a couple of different ways was a dramatic experience um and by the end of it, I mean, when I when I called my my wife at uh, at the end of it, I mean, she says that just as soon as she heard my tone of voice, she was like, this is a guy I would like to be married to. <laughs> like, not that she had never had that feeling before. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, and, and I, I mean, you, you don't magically hang on to that. I mean, I mean, you know, it's so dramatic. Yeah, you, I mean, if it works, you can just be so different. I mean, in addition to that, I had super powerful kind of, uh, I mean, almost kind of a, a psychedelic like experience on one particular night when I was meditating. It was just uh, something I wouldn't have thought possible through meditation. There was that, but that that's, that's kind of a little different um, from the, from the more gradual transformation of consciousness that that happens and and leaves you at least for a time way less judgmental of people way more appreciative of aesthetics of beauty and and you know i i'm not naturally like that that's one difference between us like you're like a foodie and you appreciate visual art and stuff i am not like that naturally and um and that's one reason i think i mean and, and and i'm not even a you know, like a literary type. And I, and I think one reason I, I, I felt kind of privileged to be able to like read your stuff and, you know, and comment on your stuff. Like I'm commenting on the work of an actual fiction writer, you know, that seemed like a kind of promotion for me. Cause I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that anyone would want my feedback. And I'm sure my feedback was, uh, was, did not have all the dimensions that feedback of that kind could have. But anyway, it, it just uh, so so I had evangelical fervor coming out of that retreat yeah. and the book didn't show up for another 14 years. And I didn't uh, sign the contract for until after the evolution of God, which came out in 2009. But um, uh, but yeah, that is my I think it's my shortest book. Uh, it's done. It's done the best commercially. Um, and, uh, but it also, it also has this kind of evolutionary psychology. Yeah, totally. That, that is, I mean, I mean, I I think it's, it's, it's the first book that, that really sets about to do that, to explain the logic of Buddhism. And, you know, when, when I say why Buddhism is true, I'm talking about what you might call the naturalistic part of Buddhism. Some people call it secular Buddhism. I'm not talking about, you know, rebirth. Um, divine beings. Uh, it, it, this is just about uh, meditation, the concept of enlightenment, um, uh, taking that seriously is at least a theoretical possibility. Uh, but yeah, I use evolutionary psychology to make the argument that mindfulness meditation actually brings you closer to a true view of the world, in part because the minds we are given by natural selection are 
literally designed to distort reality, like engineered by natural selection to distort reality. And to leave um, us dissatisfied, right? Uh, and to leave us dissatisfied. I mean, yeah, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the fundamental, you know, when when they say when 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 they say the buddhism says life is suffering which is not quite exactly what is said in the in uh in the four noble truths maybe but uh the 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 logic is that we are just recurringly dissatisfied in fact the word translated as suffering some people would translate as as unsatisfactoriness or something but but the idea is we're never satisfied for long. And, and when you think about natural selection, of course it would design animals that aren't satisfied for long. It, it right. wants them to keep like pursuing goals and, and get more genes into the next generation. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I'm personifying natural selection. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't want things consciously, but, but there is, you're right. That is, that is a, a certain part of it. And then there's just an argument about why uh, you should be suspicious of the way of the, of the way the world seems to you, and in particular, the way your feelings shade your thoughts, often in ways you're not even aware of, shade your thoughts and perceptions. So, um, yeah, that's that's the book in a way I'm happiest with, just in, because I think it's hardest to misinterpret. Um, mm. it, it's like I said, like, you know, with a moral animal, you know, some people come away like, oh, so I should cheat on my wife? I get it. No, like that, that actually wasn't um, what I meant. But I think I think the Buddhism book is uh, uh, less prone to misunderstanding. And so that that came out in 2018? 2017. 17. And are you working on something? Uh, I was going to ask you that question quickly. <laughs> I mean, I'm spending a lot of time, in addition to the podcast, I'm doing, I have this non-zero newsletter thing that is on uh, it's on Substack basically. Uh, and I recently, I mean, I've started a paid version of the newsletter and I've recently made it the home of what I'm calling the, Apoc the Apocalypse Aversion Project, uh, which I mean, kind of seriously in a way, like keep, <laughs> keep the world from like yes, descending into okay. chaos. That's a worthy goal. Yeah. And it, it has a lot of dimensions, policy. It, it includes like you know, overcoming certain cognitive biases that that keep getting us in tribal conflict in, in America and abroad and so on. So it has a lot of dimensions that could become a book, uh, The Apocalypse. I, I, I can imagine naming a book, The Apocalypse Aversion Project. I can you laugh. Is that a good idea or bad idea? <laughs> I, I can imagine you uh, coming up with that. Title because that, was not, uh, that was not that was not an endorsement. <laughs> um, of course, you would have argued against why Buddhism is true. That worked at least in a practical sense. So, what are you, uh, what are you working on now? Well, I, after the LA book, the Mirage Factor, I said, okay, I've I've done kind of three, maybe four books on urban history. I'm done with cities, but they just reeled me in again. And um, I, when I was doing the research on LA, um, I was getting very interested in San Francisco because that was the goal. You know, San Francisco yeah. developed much earlier than LA. Um, yeah. It was a big city when LA was, was you know, a little backwater. Um, and so I, you know, I sort of had to read some San Francisco history while I was reading LA history. And, and um, so I'm writing a book about San Francisco now. Um, what, what phase? Well, it's much earlier than, um, than anything I've done before. It's basically from the uh, the gold rush, uh, shortly before the gold rush, um, through the 1870s, 1880s. Uh, I haven't quite decided uh, where I'm gonna end, but um, it's still a little too early to talk about, so uh, I don't wanna-, I don't wanna Okay. I went, I went to junior high in San Francisco. Oh, did you? Yeah, I, I organized, uh, we, we each had to organize some kind of field trip. I organized a, a trip to the, the Levi Strauss factory. Now, Levi Strauss would have existed, right, when you were in the period he, you're writing about. Yes, he, uh, he came and made durable pants for the, for the gold miners to wear. I'll bet they were so durable you could hitch two horses, or was it <laughs> mules? Is it mules in the iconography that are, that are trying to tear a pair of pants apart and can't? I, I don't really remember. But, I, there, I think it's still like I should look. I think it's still on the label. 
It is. So it no, is. I have I have encountered two um, in my research, but um, you know, right now it's like there's a certain cache of letters which, for reasons too complex to explain, are at the University of Michigan. And with the pandemic, you know, I really need to see those letters in order to write mm. the book. Mm. Uh, I haven't even written the book proposal yet. Um, but we're all, you know, trapped in our homes and apartments. So um, I don't know when this next book would come out. But I got vaccinated today, Gary. You did? You should okay. try that. Really? Well, yeah. I am trying, but uh, unsuccessful. Is this the first or the second? First. Uh-huh. Well. So here's, here's uh, I don't know. Should, do we have time for, uh, I have, I have a, 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 an overarching question I could ask. Um, okay. So there are people who might be called literary snobs. I don't know. But there are definitely people who, if they heard that you started out writing fiction and wound up writing nonfiction, they'd say, Oh, I'm sorry it didn't work out, right? <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not a fan of these kinds of people because, of course, what they're saying is my kind of writing is is lower on on the hierarchy. Uh, uh, but I'm curious, like looking back, what do you feel like I, I found my calling halfway through, or like, or do you even think about it in in these terms at all? You no, know, I, I do sometimes think that I will go back to writing fiction at some point before I hmm. die, but. Hmm. Um, I think it will be very inflected historical fiction. Um, I I have found what, the one thing that has really surprised me is that the same satisfaction in craft that I had with fiction carries over to at least the kind of nonfiction I'm writing. I mean, it's the same, you know, bringing out character development, oh, pacing, yeah. uh, structuring a story. Um, and it gives me the same kind of satisfaction that coming up with a plot does you know instead i have this ocean of contradictory information known as the historical record which i mean anybody who's written history knows that the historical record is full of all kinds of contradictory information it's uh, it is missing so much there are so many groups that did not get to write history into the history historical record so it's basically you you're kind of finding the signal in all of that noise, which is very similar to, I think, coming up with a plot. In, yeah. Um, so well, uh, part of the idea, you know, when I took McPhee's course, it was called, I think, the literature of fact. And, and certainly part of the idea was that, uh, you know, um, I think he may not like the term literary nonfiction because he thinks that it, it well, I shouldn't put words in his mouth. I mean, I still see him, you know, I ride bikes with him, but, um, the uh um but i shouldn't i shouldn't i i think maybe he thinks it kind of denigrates nonfiction to think you have to th that a way of classing it up would be to call it literary <laughs> you know it's like mm -hmm. we don't need your damn adjective <laughs> um so well good uh, hour point, I believe. what's that we are at the one hour point it's we true we are, and we do have some questions for you. Um, a number of people asked some, some questions. I'll just very quickly, before getting to the questions, uh, since these came through, uh, Diane Singerman does mention that she has great uh, fond memories of physics for poets. And Bob, a message to you from Alan Safran. He says, Bob, hello, after 42 years of not seeing from, you. From the press club. Yeah. And Diane from campus club, I should say. Uh, right. So, um, yeah. But yeah, hi, Alan. I think you answered where our, another question. We had a quick question. I think you answered it, Gary, already uh, from our the first author we had in this series, uh, Josh Hammer, asked. Uh, he said you mentioned in a Facebook post uh, a while back that the pandemic was seriously impeding your research on the San Francisco book. Are you getting access to the archives online, and how's it progressing? Uh, well, I the ca the particular cache of letters that I'm thinking of is is hundreds and hundreds of letters uh, there are some that I know about that are particularly important and I have been in contact with the archivist and they have very kindly they apparently they have a budget for this now um, this was also true of the New York Public Library they are taking 
uh, manuscripts and and um, digitizing them and then emailing them to me, um, which you know helps to a certain extent, but it's like un unless I can do that for hundreds of letters, it's not going to be enough. Um, but um, it's it it's amazing how much of the secondary uh, literature is now available online too. Uh, Archives.org um, has just about any book out of copyright that they've digitized. So that can be done from home too. Um, so yeah, so, I mean, I, I could do more than I'm doing. Uh, I'm just being lazy maybe, um, okay. but uh, it, won't, it won't get done until COVID is under control. For uh, both of you, uh, Betsy Lukens asks, um, can you both talk about the intersection of your two books on the matter uh, of the appeal or draw of religion as a general phenomenon? Uh, and specifically, she references The Evolution of God being published in 2009 and The Mirage Factory published in 2018. Wondering whether Bob's book led Gary to focus in part on the religious flowering in LA. Yeah, I take full credit for that. So, so that's that's the uh, the Amy Simple McPherson. Uh, is that is that a name part of your book? Yes. I, I, I my guess is that I I believe that you're not a big fan of religion. Is is that fair to say? Uh, that's pretty fair to say. <laughs> okay. Um, I am more of a fan. I was I was brought up religiously. You, were you were you not? No. Um, my mother was. Church of England, my father was kind of nothing. And they sent me to the local Lutheran church just because it was the closest. Mm -hmm. And they would say, you know, you go, we're gonna watch the football game. And, um, <laughs> and so uh, basically after being confirmed in the Lutheran church, I never went to church again. Yeah. But I, I you know, I'm interested in it as a phenomenon and, and um, certainly it was part of the LA story. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that the evolution of God had anything to do with my choosing that story, but. I have a question from uh, Mark Samuels is asking if, uh, who was, uh, uh, he asks whether either of you happened to interact at school or later in life with Manfred Halpern. His course on personal and political transformation greatly influenced me and would seem very relevant for uh, Bob's work. Yeah, I, I remember the course. I didn't take the course. I remember the course in the catalog. I remember knowing somebody who took the course. Um, I wish I'd taken it. I am fascinated by personal transformation. Um, I'd like to undergo a more enduring one than I've ever undergone. Um, <laughs> the uh, I, I mean, I described what was a somewhat transformational experience, I guess, going to my first um meditation retreat um but i did not do you, do you remember that the course it was kind of a famously eccentric course i don't remember it at all no. yeah i forget who i knew who had who had taken it um i did my thesis under fred greenstein who passed away recently who was a big personality in politics person he was like a major major figure in that uh in that field uh, but I didn't take the I didn't take the Halpern course. Yeah. Now you. Um, you oh, all right. Got it. No, well, go, go ahead. ahead. I mean, I was about, say, there was a course, uh, a student generated course on sociobiology that you took. Yeah, that that had a big impact on my direction. I mean, I, I, I probably I was already there had been a Time magazine story in, I think, 1977 that that uh, on sociobiology. That was the term at the time, and it uh, for kind of the term for, well, not so much for evolutionary psychology, but for a cruder version of what evolved into something more nuanced that I'd call evolutionary psychology. But um, had it had the people on the cover depicted as marionettes. They were real people, but they had strings, and they seemed as if they had no volition, and so on. And so that was their take on that. I'd got I'd read that. I'd gotten interested, but yeah, there was a student initiated seminar on um, sociobiology that I took. Uh, Jim Benninger, who was then a, a sociology professor, uh, Henry Horn, John Bonner, both in the biology department, I think we're all among teachers. And uh, that, that had a big, I, I mean, 
I remember there was this moment when I finally understood the theory of kin selection, which comes out of that, which explains why animals, including humans, are uh, altruistic toward close kin. And um, it was at Campus Club during the summer uh, between junior and senior year. I was staying there to to write uh, stuff for press club client papers. And um, and I finally understood the theory. And and it was like an epiphany. That was like a transformational experience. Uh, it was just so I understood how elegant a theory it was and how powerful it was. And that um, kept me interested. Yeah. Um, Steve Greismer, uh, thanks mm. both Gary and Bob for the retrospective. And it's a suggestion, Gary, that maybe you should you can respond to uh, Gary. He suggests that you should go back to the Garden State and do a historical narrative about the state. And you could even include a few references to Princeton. <laughs> I think Steve may have been in that seminar unless I'm getting him mixed up with somebody else. I think he was in- He was campus. in the campus club. Yeah. yeah, I think he was in that student initiated seminar. Anyway, go ahead. Well, I've, you know, right now I live in Jersey City, which is actually the city I was born in. And um, talk about legendary mayors, uh, Mayor Haig was largely considered almost as corrupt as Big Bill Thompson in Chicago. Um, so I've, con I've actually considered doing something about Jersey City, but probably not. Um, Keith Corbett uh, asked a question of Bob. Uh, Hi, Keith. Might, might, might you speak to any influence on your work from books we discussed circa 1980 about Timothy Leary, cosmic consciousness, and the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Yeah, see, Keith was living at that house, as I said, Gary, and he was into this Who's cosmic stuff. Uh, wedding that we just attended. What's that? We just attended his wedding at the last... Uh... Yes, we did. Uh, to Simone, who was a fellow transfer student, I had met her in that context, but I digress. Yeah. Um, she, uh, so... Uh, yeah. Now, the book I remember, I do remember all that stuff. Keith was highly cosmic. Uh, <laughs> and But a book I, I, I think maybe he brought to my attention was this uh, Gregory Bateson book uh, on, it was a very cybernetic uh, view. Or, uh, it was, oh, what was it? It was about mind and, uh, and stuff. Um, but yeah, that, that, uh, I do think in retrospect, that was probably a year that got me permanently interested in kind of the intersection of physics and philosophy and, um, and metaphysics, you know, uh, questions of consciousness, um, you know, mind body problem. It was, yeah, that was, uh, that was a great year. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, so that, that was Gary, again, where you intersected, uh, with me in a way that was probably responsible for our, our just keeping track of each other, keeping in touch and even knowing that we both lived in Brooklyn when we did, and then mm -hmm. staying in touch after that. But yeah, uh, whatever cosmic, whatever conversations you and I had there, there's a good chance that, uh, Keith was part of them. Uh, uh Dave, David Keller asks, uh, as a scientist, I've certainly read much nonfiction that's written with little literary style. People can analyze clearly without writing clearly. I think there's value in integrating those skills. How do we do that? And I think uh, that might be directed at both of you. So how do you integrate, how do you make writing clear yet entertaining kind of? I think so, yes. Um, well, uh that's a tough question i was just i was just flashing back to that famous line about uh that famous book review put down there is much in this book that's new and much that's interesting unfortunately what's new isn't interesting what's interesting isn't new it's kind of like, um but that's not exactly you couldn't quite say that about clear and entertaining exactly the um uh well you know uh <laughs> i agree that it's rare and hard. I mean, there, there's, you know, I was, it, it's hard. It's hard, you know, it's hard even for the people who understand the ideas to make them clear. Because like I had a job at the Sciences Magazine for a while. My job was basically to take things written by experts, academics, 
and then edit them, which sometimes meant rewriting them in a way that made them accessible to a lay audience. And like the first problem you have is that the people who actually understand the ideas deeply have lost touch with what the average person out there actually knows because they're just used to communicating with their fellow experts and they'll throw out these words, assuming people know what they mean. So the people who understand them have trouble being clear for purposes of a lay audience. And then, you know, so I think really uh, you're probably better off if you want to be both clear and entertaining coming to the subject as a lay person, but then it takes a lot of work to get clear on this stuff. Um, and it's when people do that, uh, that kind of work um, that I think you, you get the best. I, I, here's an interesting related question, Gary, do you think like, the best scientists are the clearest writers. There've been some great scientists who have been very clear uh, uh, writers. Um, well, I mean, Einstein wrote great primers to, to the theories of, of relativity. Um, Bertrand Russell was a great writer. Um, even uh, Watson and Crick, you know? Um, yeah. Richard Feynman is very clear, entertaining lecture. Darwin was a was a very good writer. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I think uh, it it's, goes hand in hand with an ability to sort of like imagine yourself into a state of ignorance. You know, you're, you're that, yeah, like cognitive that. empathy, like imagine put yourself in the shoes of the person who see like this is all of the bad stuff in the world is <laughs> I think is a result of. I mean, the slight exaggeration, but a failure of people to put themselves in the shoes of people different from themselves. I mean, wars, I definitely mean bad software. It's like, it's like, hey, I'm not a computer engineer, okay? You're really gonna have to walk me through this slowly. Uh -huh. um, and, and uh, but that is, that is a great, that is a really important writing skill is the ability to put yourself in the shoes of the reader. And you can never do it perfectly because in fact, there are different kinds of readers. You have to have this kind of average reader in mind, but, um, but yeah, I, I think that that is the skill most lacking in the world generally, um, kind of cognitive empathy, putting yourself in the just, just perspective taking. And, and I think many, many great writers are really good at that. On a, uh, on a lighter note, uh, another author in our series, Billy Aronson asks, uh, looking at both of you, he wants to know which one of you has more books. <laughs> I think I already surrendered on that one, didn't I? Um, I don't know, you live in a house, and I live in a two bedroom apartment, so. Uh, I still remember a, a play at On Team by Billy Aronson. I think it had the word C in the title or something, S-E-A, maybe I'm wrong. The C, ch C change, I think. I don't uh, think it was C change. No. He would know. We have an expert. Yeah. It's like it's like the scene in Woody Allen where Marshall McLuhan shows up. That's right. That's right. Rick uh, Rick Justin asks. Uh, you both mentioned the economic reality and pressures associated with your writing. If at some point that were to become irrelevant, would it influence what you write and how? I. I feel that I have a certain obligation to write a book that people will want to read um, because I kind of have an experience having written a book that maybe a lot of people didn't want to read, which was extravagance, uh, which was when I had, I had done the two books for money, the two thrillers for money. And I said, all right, I'm going to do something for myself. And I wrote that book. Um, now I, you know, I want to write a book that I would want to read. Um, so it has to, you know, I think it would have to have a certain amount of commercial appeal. So even if I didn't need the advance, I think I would write something that that would be somewhat commercial. Um, but, you know, I'm usually interested in certain questions and, and I try to explore them in, in an entertaining way. But um, yeah, I mean, I think the I want to be read. I think most writers want to be read, um, even even if they're even if they don't write like it. <laughs> right, exactly. 
Um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree that the commercial pressure is in a way a good thing because you do want to be read and you want editors who say, no, that title is not going to get anybody to buy the book if they're right. I mean, uh, and, and, but I just feel I've been lucky in that I have basically written about the things that interested me most and that I wanted to learn about. Um, and I've been able to uh, make a living, not, not just on the books. I've done other things at the same time, but, um, but I feel I, I've, uh, I've been lucky in that way. And uh, I don't think I'd have taken a radically different, for that reason, I guess, I, I don't think I'd, I'd have taken uh, a radically different course if I had been free of economic pressure. Yeah. Maybe I'd still be writing literary short stories. I don't know, but I don't think so. I'd, I'd be reading them. <laughs> that, that's one. Uh -huh. uh, Catherine Riemann uh, asks uh, uh, for Bob, one of the wonderful things about your prose is when reading it feels like being part of a fascinating one-on-one -on -one conversation with you, both in terms of what you say and how you say it. Are you writing to somebody uh, uh, and how do you uh, as to draft and how do you collect uh, uh, your anecdotal experiences? Wow. Um, that's very nice. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. I think, um, you know, I was saying I didn't have, uh, I earlier alluded to the fact that Gary, I think one thing you and I have in common is that we didn't, we didn't, you know, uh, come from you know families that you would think of as like you know highly cultured and intellectual and stuff i think in some ways that can be an advantage i i mean you know if you're like steeped in like a certain kind of literature and have that in mind as the ideal or something you know uh i i think that can complicate communication with with people since uh you know, you you know, there, there's it's not that likely that your literary ideal is somebody who speaks modern conversational English. You know, so um, I mean, I also I I think I benefited a lot from working a couple of years in just a small newspaper right after I failed as a freelance writer, um, and 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 uh, which just just you know puts you in touch with the ordinary events of. Of ordinary people and, and and put you in the business of just communicating with them you just you just say what happened and try to do it in clear language um the uh but um i mean as for kind of anecdotes my last book was the well i guess my first and last book were both had first person dimensions the first one was kind of some you are there journalism describing my role as interviewer and then the last one was more reflective um, and, uh, I like, it certainly saves time on the research when you can just write, <laughs> write about what happened to you. Um, it's, it's, uh, you have to be careful. I mean, and, and I, I don't know that I always show enough restraint because there's a limit to how much people want to know about you, but, uh, uh, Leslie Spencer asks, uh, hi, Leslie, uh, Bob and in terms of both capacity to communicate and impact, what do you think of Jordan Peterson? <laughs> Gary, do you have a view on Jordan Peterson? I have no view on Jordan Peterson. Fascinating case. Uh, I mean, I mean, one lesson from him is that the fastest way to rise to, to I guess, intellectual stardom, David Brooks called him the most important intellectual in, in the universe or something uh, a couple of years ago. Um, is to outrage people. Um, I need to get better at that. I've done a certain amount, but apparently not enough. Um, he's, uh, he's a fascinating, I haven't, I, I'm not, I have never sat down and read that much Jordan Peterson. Uh, I, when I've, I've tried to kind of listen to some of his lectures and I've kind of concluded, I mean, first of all, he's saying, he's saying things that people want to hear. Some people want to hear. There are people who need to be told just quit whining, clean up your room. And, and that's like good for them, you know? Uh, so he's got, you know, he's got some messages that resonate. Um, but, but I've concluded that like, he's so good at talking that he can get by without actually 
is it is this a form where I can be uncharitable without actually saying very much clearly? I, I like at the end of one of his lectures, I'm, I'm like, OK, so what what was it? He's an extremely entertaining talker and presenter. Um, I he uh, I don't know. He's an interesting case. He's definitely he's tapping into an interest in. In, in spiritual things, in religious things, in myth, without, to my mind, uh, being as, as maybe as clear as I'd like. Um, but he's obviously a person of, uh, of huge talent. Um, and uh, I'm jealous, I guess. Yeah, I'm jealous. That's my last word on him. Can I, uh, can I ask one myself? Uh, it's a little bit long-winded, but in, in non-zero... Uh, written in 2000, you wrote that globalization has been in the cards since the invention of life. Uh, the book makes a compelling case for our evolution toward complexity and greater interdependence, wars, plagues, droughts, barbarian hordes, and other catalysts of epic collapse were discussed as temporary setbacks. A lot has obviously happened since 2000. And in 2017, in Bo Why Buddhism is True, you wrote more and more groups of people define their identity in terms of sharp opposition to groups of people. I consider tribalism the biggest problem of our time. It could undo millennia of movement toward global integration just when technology has brought the prospect of a cohesive planetary community within reach. Does this represent a change in your thinking or is tribalism another temporary setback? Um, I don't see it as representing a fundamental change. I mean, the, the idea of non-zero was what was inevitable, well, two separate things, the evolution of, well, what was highly likely was the eventual evolution of some intelligent species, might not be like us, but it would be a, enough like us to launch technological evolution, which I think kind of did the rest in terms of making it likely we get to the brink of cohesive global social organization. I tried to emphasize that the rest I didn't think was in, was uh, necessarily likely much less inevitable. In other words, a happy ending uh, was far from assured. I, I mean, uh, various reasons to think that at this point, when although the logic of the of our situation pushes us toward, you know, I think international governance, global community, a lot of reasons to think we'll blow it and. Uh, and descend into chaos. I still feel that way. Uh, the 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 um, there's there's maybe more reason now to be pessimistic than there was in 2000. Um, but you know, same uh, same basic challenges that have been with us forever. And and that's uh, uh, in terms of the the tribalism. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not necessarily optimistic. It's what I'm focusing on now. Like in in my newsletter, um, I mean that's why I said you know the apocalypse aversion project. It's kind of a joke and kind of not. Um, so I don't know, Gary. Are you optimistic? Uh, not as much as I was in 2000. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think that, you know the internet has not worked out the way we had hoped. Um, I think. In the beginning, we thought, oh, this will allow everybody to be exposed to the whole range of, of uh, opinions and, and uh, people out there. And instead, it's just turned into this you know, series of, of little holes that people can, can go into, little bubbles that people can go into. And I think that that's, you know, in large part, responsible for the increasing tribalism we're seeing. Um, it, it's been a, it's been a facilitator. I mean, there's always been the problem in human history of, of groups of people uh, hating other groups of people. Um, but the Internet certainly has not cured it. It's presenting it in new forms. I think the good news is, you know, we haven't had that much time to adjust. I mean, it, it, it's radical change. Social media are, is a radical change. Mm -hmm. And we're just trying to figure out uh, ways to make it a more wholesome influence and and. Uh, I have some ideas, but, uh, but, you know, people should subscribe to your newsletter. Gosh, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, but, you know, come to think of it, I agree. Uh, um, yeah. So, 
Um, for Bob, quickly, uh, Marcia Zuckerman uh, asks, um, and I'll, I'll just paraphrase, um, a, a very helpful uh, thing said to her was uh, based on Darwin, if not for errors in gene transcription, humans would never have evolved. So how desirable is perfection? Well, I, I think the, oh, the, the idea being that there's virtue in error. Um, well, there's virtue in mutation. I mean, I mean, I mean, there's virtue in like a lot of ideas being out there for us to choose from, which is the kind of analog of, uh, of I guess, natural um, selection. The internet certainly generates that. I mean, maybe the the problem is the selective mechanism. We don't seem to be doing a good job of retaining the best of, uh, I mean, every conceivable idea is out there, I think, about what we should do now. Um, but the, uh, I mean, as for evolution itself, but I think the, pro you know, a lot of the problem we face is that it is a process. I mean, although it rests on error in a certain sense or, or rests on mutation and, and sexual recombination and innovation, um, it is an optimizing process. The trouble is what it is optimized for is just the transmission of genes into the next generation. And that's that criterion of design does, has not uh, created human brains that are necessarily well equipped to uh, handle the, the, the challenge we now face. Um, um, uh, finally, um, Simone Schloss, uh, uh, wanted to put in a plug for, uh, as a university librarian, I'd like to put in a plug for archive.org. So many of our books from the late 20th century have not been digitized commercially, but have been scanned and available from the Internet Archive. Three of Gary's books, which may have been digitized commercially, appear there. Uh, and many thanks for mentioning Keith Corbett's in my 2019 wedding on campus just under the wire before the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank our uh, thank our panelists today for a fascinating conversation. It was uh, uh, one of the one of the, just a, a, a very very interesting uh, perspective on, on on a number of things. It's been one of the a very enjoyable thing for me, and I know for Catherine, our my uh, the co our, my co producer, uh, to get to know these guys over the last few weeks and. Uh, and become much more acquainted with their, their work and their thoughts. I'd like to thank the, uh, our attendees for their thoughtful, uh, thoughtful and probing questions. And uh, just say that this, uh, uh, will be, this has been recorded and it will be available on the 79 YouTube channel, uh, presumably sometime early next week. Thank you all. Well, Bruce, thanks to you and, and to Phil Huber and Catherine for, for this. And, and thank you, Gary. And, and thanks to everyone. And yeah. uh, Bruce, I think you're supposed to mention something about the trip, uh, the, the trip to the Galapagos. Oh, yeah. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, I was uh, so carried away with the discussion that I forgot. We're, uh, uh, you may have seen some announcements. Uh, the class, uh, the class is, uh, is looking at... Uh, Provide, having a trip to the Galapagos Islands in uh, uh, May of 2022. Uh, hopefully all this mess will be behind us by then. Uh, it would be a, a, a charter, uh, chartering an entire boat for the class. Um, uh, we have some interest already, but uh, if you'd like to uh, 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 let us know, uh, let, Phil, let Phil Huber know in particular, uh, that uh, you have interest uh, in in the trip. It looks to be a fantastic one. Thank you. So that's it. <laughs>